Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. I'm your host, Jody Harrison Bauer, and I'm so excited to have you here with me once again. If you are new to the show, thank you so much for joining us. Fearlessly Authentic is about educating, empowering, entertaining you a bit, and inspiring you to live your most fearlessly authentic life. And this is really meaningful to me because I am a self-proclaimed scaredy cat and was always afraid to take risks until I decided to take a big step out of my comfort zone and change my life. And my guest today is going to talk about the struggles which has given her strength and her story is remarkable and will inspire you so much. I have so much love and excitement about having her here and believe it, not believe it or not, but I purchased her book like two years ago before I even got to meet her. So we're, we're just going to get into the nitty gritty here. But um, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. Please remember to review, rate, subscribe, go to YouTube, check us out so you can see what I look like with my guests. So you can see us talking. Don't do it while you're driving in the car. At Jody Harrison Bauer, you can find me anywhere at Jody Harrison Bauer. I love hearing from you. So YouTube, any streaming podcast, Instagram, Facebook, that's where you can find me. And one more thing. Um, no, that's it. So yeah, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. It's like those things that podcast people always have to ask our audience to do. Five-star rating. Right now, over 100 countries are listening to us. So thank you so much from everyone around the world. And without further ado, here is my amazing guest, Erica Kramer. Welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. Hello, Jody. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> She is coming to us straight from Australia, and um, I am just so honored to have you here today. And for those ladies and men who have never heard of Erica, well, I have a surprise in store for you today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Erica, who is the Queen of Confidence. She is an international confidence coach and popular five-star pod coast host, the Cardi B, and I think you should add in there Lizzo, of the personal development world. Erica is a full-flavored, spicy, inspirational speaker with a large dose of heart and humor. After surviving many traumatic experiences from childhood sexual abuse, being in and out of the foster care system, car accident, and a whole lot of loss, Erica is a beaming and a beautiful example of how you can heal your personal story to transform trauma into triumph. Her mission is clear and she is unstoppable. Create a global empowered community of women who want deep connection, accountability, and encouragement to go for the life they deserve. So simply said, such a strong statement but that is truly what you stand for. And that is why I bought, bought your book and why I'm obsessed with you. So thank you and welcome I again. Love you. I love you, Jody. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I can't believe you got the book to you. Like that is so weird synchronicity. We were always going to do this. Oh. We were always going to do it. And it was, uh, this is the cover for anybody watching on YouTube. And the name of the book is called Confidence Feels Like Shit. And I love that because it's such... The struggle is the shitty part to becoming that confident person. Yeah. And I, I don't think confidence is, a, it is something we can maintain, but I think as we evolve as women, we are always working on a new part of our confidence, right? Yeah, totally, totally. It's like layers and layers. Um, and I like to say we create it. I used to say like, reclaim your confidence. And it's something now that I don't, I don't say that anymore because it's not that it's been taken away. It's that we stop creating it. It's that we think we are confident or we're not confident. Like we're screwed if we don't have it and that's it. And those lucky women over there get it. And it's like, no, every single one of us can have it, but we need to create it. That's, that's interesting. So I, my personal story, and we're going to get into your entire personal story is just a quickie is because this isn't about me. It's all about you. Um, is I always struggled with self-confidence and it wasn't until I decided to get divorced 20 years ago that I started digging myself out of that hole to find my self-esteem and self-confidence. Do you 
think that somebody does need to go through the struggles of life to become confident? Or do you think that there are, I mean, you coach women all over the world. Do you find that there are women that are just truly confident from the get-go? No, <laughs> I think we need to go through the difficult things of life um, as unfortunate as it is. I mean, you touched on a little bit, like I know not to drink and drive. I know every kid gets told by their parents or the police or the law to not drink and drive. However, at 23, when I broke my back, that's how I learned. And did I need that accident? We would like to think that we don't need these terrible near-death experiences and dramatic things to happen for us to wake up to our lives and go, shit, life is precious. Shit, who cares what people think? Shit, I'm worth it. Like, no, I wish. I wish that was the case. But I think for all of us, we need to live the experiences. And what I find, and I'm sure you as well in your life, is those experiences give you this internal confidence that a Tony Robbins, UPW, uh, my book, Oprah Winfrey, nobody could give you that. That's inside you when you experience it. It's like, wow, you know? <laughs> yeah. So what do you say to women? And we're going a little off of the, the chronological order I want to go into, but I really want the listeners to hear from you first, like how powerful you are is how do you get a woman I'm or men. Uh, do you coach men as well, or is it primarily women? That I serve women, women. Yeah, okay, okay. Women. So how do you take a woman who is stuck? Right, you and I have both been stuck. Um, how do you take somebody who's stuck? They feel powerless. They don't know what direction to take their lives. You know, do I stop this job? Do I get out of this relationship? Do I move to Australia like you did? Do I, you know, um, how how do you get somebody unstuck? I know that's a really, really big question. Yeah, I think I love this because I believe that no one can do that for you. Like no mentor, no book, nobody changes your life. Like it has to come from you and it has to be a decision that you go, I'm tired of my own shit. I am, I'm ready. Like I'm looking in the mirror and I see myself looking back at me. It's like woman in the mirror moment of like, right. or man in the mirror moment of like, okay, it's you against you, boo. You've been the only one here the whole time right. getting into trouble. It, so I think that it has to be us and it has to be that we are super ready to go. I'm tired of this, whatever this has been, I'm going to now commit to doing this. And when we do, I think the first step that every single one of us takes, whether we're aware of it or not, is we become aware of what we're feeling and what we're thinking. So it's like the awareness of your lived experience. For example, oh, wow, I called myself stupid. Oh, wow, there I go. I said it again. Mm -hmm. I'm so stupid. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, wow. I said it again. I'm going to just pay attention to how much in one day I call myself a stupid idiot. Just that. Wow. After seven days, I've realized that I've at least five times a day in every conversation, I call myself a stupid idiot or I apologize for no goddamn reason at all. I say, sorry, like it's my fault. Mm. Wow. Awareness. Hmm. Cool. Now that I know, now I can decide what am I going to do about this? How do we shift this? But if we don't have the awareness, if we don't have the, if we don't get our own lived experience, how can we go change our lives if we don't even have any data of what's going on. So I think that's the first step is going, awareness. how do I speak about myself? Yeah. Like what are my thoughts? What are your top three most messed up thoughts that you think every day about yourself? If you don't know that you need to get to knowing those three thoughts because those I, are the three thoughts that we, yeah, we've been having them forever. Yeah. And I think a lot of that we start going through in our late teens yeah. and if we have the right mentors or family members or whomever it is that we look up to, hopefully they bring that awareness to us, to yeah. ourselves. You know, I got married in my twenties. You, you were married in your twenties, right? 19, 19. 19 yeah. yeah. So you were young when you got married and we didn't have, I, I can't speak for you, but I, I don't think that most women at 19 or I was 24 getting married have that self-awareness and, you know, all of a sudden we wake up in our late 20s or early 30s, for me, it was in my late 30s that I woke up and started having that awareness and that, that you know, shit talk 
yeah. that we do to ourselves. And I remember like helping clients when, when I still had my studio, you know, when my clients would get down on themselves about like not eating right, for example. And at the beginning, and I don't know if you were like this, Erica, but at the beginning, you're like, why don't they just get this, right? Come <laughs> on, ladies, just yeah. get this. Because it took us, you know, we're like, we got it now. Like, come yeah. on, come on. And then all of a sudden I had to pull it back. Has that ever happened to you where you're like, totally. why isn't this clicking with you? Like, I'm giving you everything. A hundred percent. I think because you know, like you, you've done it. So you got the hindsight and you're like, oh my gosh. And that's that, that first question that we talked about is, we have to be ready. It's like you want it for someone so bad. I mean, you have yes. so much knowledge when it comes to body and image and fitness and movement and self-love and owning your age and owning who you are. Like you are the queen of that. However, how many people just aren't there? And will they get there? I don't know. Can you help them? Yes. But will they get to the place where they realize that that's what they need to do? That is the thing. That's the that's the question, right? That's right. That's the question that I think... I believe we need to hit rock bottom. We need to get some horrible shit happening to us to wake up to our lives and be like, oh my gosh, because we don't just do it by reading a book or listening to a podcast. We won't listen. It's like, you have to have that experience, I think. I so, you've given me goosebumps already like three times. Oh, I love you. Um, because I agree with you because I've been there. I've been to that yeah. rock bottom. And so let's go back and talk about your rock bottom. You mentioned- you know, in the intro, in your bio, the trauma you've been through. And we don't have to go through everything specifically, but let's talk about the car accident. You said you were driving while you were drinking and you broke your back, but then it went, Where? what happened? You were there. That was a dark place for you. You know, share that with us if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah. So I was um, 23 and my husband at the time was driving and we went out that night. We were living in Florida yeah. at the time. He had just come back from Iraq. He went to war um, and he got this new car. It was like a fast and the furious car. So it didn't have that like speed chip. And it went like, I don't know, in Australia now that I'm in Australia, it's 240 kilometers an hour. I think that's 180 American. Basically the end of the speedometer that you can go, that's like how fast it goes we're all going. the way. Okay. All the way to the end. Like, eh, wow. you know, we were, we were going and he fell asleep in fifth gear. And I was asleep at the back and my, my, his friend was at the front. And I remember getting into that car drunk as hell, telling them, put a seatbelt on guys, put a seatbelt on. Do you think I put a seatbelt on? No, I did not. So I wasn't a mother at that time. I didn't have a nurturing mother that taught me to care about others. But as a woman, I was already so concerned about other people and not worried about myself. I fell asleep in the back and I didn't have a seatbelt. So when we smashed into a ditch, that pushed us into a van, which moved us into a store. And then we hit a tree. So like we hit all these things and I was ejected out of the vehicle, like 25 feet in the air and landed halfway on the, I know it was crazy. I landed on the carbon fiber hood of the car, you know, the big wing thing. And yes. then halfway in a van. And so I broke my back, like shattered my spine, broke my left ankle, had to be taken by a helicopter. And I was in the hospital for 30 days. So I'm in, I'm like a permanently attached to a morphine pump. They had to fuse my back with like titanium and thank God, like I wasn't paralyzed. First of all, thank God that was thank a miracle. God. Thank God we didn't hurt anyone else. Cause that's right. a possibility. It was like 3am. Thankfully people were sleeping and I learned how to walk again. So like I'm in the hospital with a catheter. They wouldn't let me out of the hospital till I could pee on my own. I mean, I right. still, when I pee, go, thank goodness I can pee on my own. Like it's wow. one of those crazy things. Yes. So yeah, it was just, a, it was a wake up call. I thought Jody, but it wasn't really the wake up call. It was like a little wake up call. Right. So that wasn't your rock bottom, even though you probably thought I can't get lower than that. Right. Oh, I was like, I'm at the, I'm on the floor <laughs> in, a, in a walker. Like I'm walking with a walker and I was 23. Like why well, used to be sexy watching MTV, feeling horrible yeah. about myself. Right. Um, right. So that was, so, that was, yeah, that was that, that big moment ish. And then there was something else that happened. Right. So what, but what was going through your mind at the time, just being grateful for being alive everybody else survived and you were like, all right, I'm back up. I've learned how to walk. I mean, even though it's, I'm making it sound simple. Yeah. That was a rough time. But then, then what happened after that? What was going through your head after you were rehabbed? 
I, I think like, I think at the time I was like, oh my gosh, I almost just died. Mm -hmm. Holy moly. What am I doing? I was in the military at the time. So I was right. full time in the army. And like I said, my husband went to Iraq. So when we, he came back from Iraq, we lived in California on a base. And I was like, all about him. Like you just went to war out of high school. Like, do you want to go to school? What do you want to do? So he mm -hmm. went to Florida for school. I was in the army and I just got up out of that bed. And I was like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Like, I did not come here to be in the army. Like, I don't want to do this. So it was a wake up call in the sense of what else do you want to do? So I started going to hair school. I started studying at Paul Mitchell Academy mm -hmm. and I wanted to be an actress and I, I still love it, like performing. And so I had a girlfriend who invited me to a photo shoot and I started modeling. I started like, I just started doing like putting myself out there. And I was like, that was my little wake up call. So I was like, cool. I hate this. I love that part of your story. I, I love that. Go ahead. Like in the military in my uniform. And then on the weekends doing like bikini modeling for Daytona bike week yeah. and Pitbull music videos in Miami and then hair school at night. It was like my Gemini dreams were coming. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's crazy. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm getting my shit together. I'm on a roll. This is okay. Like I'm fine. Um, and then the following year was the 5th of May. We had a, you know, in America, how we watch the boxing fights at someone's house and mm -hmm. it's a thing. It's not a thing in Australia. So it's a thing in America. We had a party at our house and it was like Cinco de Mayo and we had friends over. We were drinking at our house. Nobody was leaving after that accident. We did not drink and drive. Everybody wore a seatbelt. Right. Like literally it was like that was never heard of ever again. Right. And that night I had my one weekend a month with the army. And so I was like, guys, I'm going to bed. I can't drink anymore. I have to wake up at like 6 a.m. and go to the army thing. And you don't mess around. You can't be late to that. And thank so you I for your service. Bed. Thank you. Hey, I know. I was like, I'm a veteran. This is crazy. So I went to bed and then my husband's I a veteran up. too. Oh, is he? Yeah. That's oh, how he put he... himself through medical school. Oh, wow. ROTC. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it just feels like another world, like my mm. world now. And that world's like, what? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I woke up in the morning and my husband wasn't next to me. And I was just like, where's Gio? Like what's happened? And I was really late. I was rushing around. His friends were in the living room. I thought maybe he's in the car sleeping. I don't know. I was like, guys, I can't find him, but I have to go. Like, I didn't think anything bad had happened. Worst case he's asleep in the car or he's in the bathroom, passed out. We drank whatever. So right. I ran off and I'm calling his friends. Like, can you just look for him? I'm in the army. I'm calling his phone. It's ringing. I'm like, okay, that's good. The phone's ringing. And then it was like about 10 AM and I started getting worried. And I told my supervisor who was like, she's like a mother. She's like a mother to me, this woman. She was my army supervisor. And I was like, Hey, um, we had a party and Gio didn't come home, but I'm sure he's okay. But I just want to let you know, I'm a little bit distracted right now. And I don't know. She's like, why don't you call around the hospitals, call the you know, police, call the prison, whatever. I called all these people, nothing. And then it was 1145. And it started raining. And I was like, where is my husband? Mm, and then I started yeah. getting really like, oh, I got a bit worried. And it was yeah. more than worried. I started feeling like something's not right. So yeah. I was like, Verma, I got I to gotta go home. Like, I got to find him. And she's like, go. So I went. His friends were there. We were looking for him. We couldn't find him. I went home and I saw that the hospital had rang me um, at like 6 a.m. Now, the hospital always called me because the year before when I broke my back, I was a silly 23 year old and I didn't get medical insurance with the military, which is like $27 a month. Okay. And I said right. no to it. So young people <laughs> get the damn insurance. Right. And they were always calling me. I owed like a hundred thousand dollars in medical bills. I'm pretty sure I still owe that. Like my credit is ruined in America because of it. And it was like, oh, maybe they're calling for the billing department. But I'm like, do they call it 6 a.m.? So anyway, I called the hospital, the Orlando Regional Medical Hospital. And I'm like, hi, somebody called me. I can't find my husband. And this young man on the phone was kind of like, hey, ma'am, we can't give you information like that. Why don't you come in? It felt very like nonchalant. Why don't you just come in? I'm like, okay, we can't find him. Let's go. So we all went to the hospital, me and his two friends. And I walked into the emergency department and I saw the man who I was on the phone with. He was like 18 years old, a boy. And he looked at me and he's like, look down. And I'm like, okay. Then he's like, just go wait over there. So he points to me to go to one of those waiting rooms where they give you bad news. And I'm like, I don't want to wait there. He's like, don't worry, just go in there. Like, it'll be the best place for you to wait. And I felt like Jody, like five hours. It felt like I was in there. I don't even know how long I was in there. And this little old lady came out and she's like, honey, don't worry. My husband's having surgery. This is the room where they just, they put family. So don't worry. And I was like, she calmed me down for like two minutes. And then I started freaking out and the double doors open and the nurse comes out and a doctor comes out and they just look at me and they're like, I'm so sorry. He didn't make it. And I'm just like, 
I'm sorry. And they're like, your husband, Giovanni Lopez, we're so sorry. We did everything we could. And I'm just like, I'm so, what? I'm like, I'm like, moment of insanity. Like I talked about it in the book. Like I, I know. think I went insane. I don't actually know. It was like Charlie brought wobble, wobble. Like, I don't know what they were saying. And my friends, like Gio's high school, like school friend from back home was on the ground wailing. This grown man was wailing. His friend was crying. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't understand. What do you mean? And like, I couldn't understand. And it was right, just. Right. This was like the surreal. furthest thing. And it, it was an out of body experience. Yeah. Totally. When I re read this in your book and you described it so perfect, I, I was like on the verge of tears. I just, I felt, I, I can't even imagine what, what you must've been feeling and going through just so crazy and like I had never had anyone die in my life and now this is after sexual abuse having a bipolar mother who physically abused me being kidnapped by my father like foster homes sexual abuse physical abuse this is after like a life of shit and now my husband's like I'm like I'm done like I just I lost it I couldn't I don't even know what I did Verma my army military supervisor who's literally like my mom looked after me completely and that just was like I just lost my husband and that was my rock bottom. Like I went numb Jody for maybe yeah. three to five years. I actually right. don't remember. I kept modeling. I was drinking and driving. I was like, I was like this cold lost person who just felt like I am damaged goods. My, I am broken. Like I'm a piece of shit. Like something's wrong with me. My life is horrible. And like, yeah. And, and it wasn't until really like I met a man in Las Vegas and I was like, oh, where are you from? Australia. Amazing. He was a horrible guy, but I, right. I was so blind by my own pain that I followed this man to Australia, hoping to escape all my shit life, which, you know, it follows you across the ocean if you try it, to run away. It does. And I think so many women listening right now can totally relate to your story, not specifically, but yeah. hitting that rock bottom. And when you mention in your book and when you mentioned just now, you were at rock bottom for three to five years. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about hitting rock bottom, a lot of people think, oh, it's a couple of months. Like, like, can we get our shit together? Like, we are a piece of shit. We're a loser. Like, it's been three months. Like, please. No, like, you had to go through this. And I always refer to myself as a slow learner. Like, I got to get knocked, um, you know, <laughs> by the side of my head, like, five times to go, Jody, yeah. did you learn it yet? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that's why so many ways we're on the same level, <laughs> but three to five years, you were in this dark place. Like you said, drinking and driving, you were still modeling, you were still kind of functioning, but you knew like you were, there was no happiness. No, absolutely. Like I was the most least confident person in the world. I was yeah horrible to myself. I felt literally like something was wrong with me. Like I am yeah. cursed. Like yeah. after all that, and then my husband dies, I'm like, are you for a real God? Like, is there a God? I don't even know. I don't even know if I believe in anything. Like I was pessimistic as hell. Yeah. I hated myself. I hated life. I don't know how I didn't like attempt anything terrible, but I was just like, I don't care anymore about anything. And like, maybe I need a man to rescue me that is, has money that is educated because I'm clearly ridiculously dumb and horrible. I need someone who's going to make me feel worthy because I'm not worthy. Clearly like all the bad things that women I speak to and you speak to believe we're right in front of me coming true. And I'm like, hundred percent evidence, evidence, evidence. And so when I came to Australia and I was blinded by this thing, I thought was love. This guy was not a nice guy, but I wanted to run away. And then I lasted with him in Australia about 11 months. And the one thing that I'm proud of old Erica that I did was he sucked. Like he was not a good guy. Like, God bless you, Paul. Thank you for bringing me to Australia, buddy. But man, he was a jerk, right? And did not treat me well at all. <laughs> I was hoping I, for happiness when I read I that part in your book. I'm like, like yes. <laughs> and then I'm like, <laughs> oh. For the love of my life, who was a douchebag. And then I'm, I'm in Australia and I'm like, in the middle of nowhere, like moved to this terrible place that is not Sydney. It was just horrible. Like the hood of Australia I moved to. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, you know, those moments where you're like, what the hell am I doing? What, what is my life? What is this? Yeah, and I what, called, I know I called Sergeant Lopez, who was like my military mom. And I'm like, ma, I don't know what's going on. She's like, I'll send you the money. You want to buy a ticket? Come back home, come back to Florida. And I'm like, 
I am not going to accept defeat because if I leave Australia now, I'm going to see a kangaroo in a movie or a damn boomerang. And then I'm going to be like, I failed. And I'm like, no, I'm going to rewire what this place is going to mean to me. And I'll just find a job. I'll stay for my visa and then I'll go back home. That didn't happen. I met another guy who was similar to the first guy, a lot nicer, but the same shit. He was not nice. He was very condemning, very like hide your past. Don't tell my parents that your dad left your mom, that you come from a broken family. Very like weird and, and people pleasy. And I couldn't sneeze the way I sneeze around his family. Right. So you were you oh were kind God. of looking for somebody to rescue you, to totally. take you away, to Fix escape me. from Erica. Right. Yeah, you were I'm messed up. Yep. I, yeah. I, I, I've been there, done that several times. Yeah. And you think that a man is going to save you and they never do because we have wow. to save ourselves first, but we don't know when we're going through it. We just think, yep, this is the right place for me to go. Yep. Mm -hmm, it's going there. Yep. And then you're it's like, like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm walking on eggshells now. I know. And you put all your power into other things external from you to make you feel good. And whenever we do that, like social media, like your body, like your age, your money, your bank account, your Gucci bag, all these external things that mean nothing about you. That that is not who you are. You are not your hair, you are not your nails, you are not your 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 hat. I mean, whatever. You are not these external things. And so it wasn't until I I met this second guy and then so I moved to Sydney, Australia which was a little bit of a ghetto side of Australia um, for this one guy. Then I meet this other guy, same, same guy. I say same guy, different, you know what, face. Um, <laughs> and he lives in Melbourne, Australia. And now I'm in a, Melbourne now, another city of, of Australia for this other guy. Losers are us. He breaks up with me on my birthday and I'm at loser. the gym, right? I'm like, I'm such a loser. I have no friends. I don't even have a kangaroo friend. And I'm in Australia and I can't believe this. this is not the way I wanted it to work out. So I'm at the gym because all I wanted to do was exercise. You know, when you break up and you're like, I'm going to look after myself and be sexy. So I'm at the gym. My personal Absolutely, trainer. Absolutely. Like, yeah. I yeah, tell people like, that all the time. That's what we do though. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, Erica, get mm -hmm. your shit together. I'm at the, I'm at the gym. I have a nail technician and a personal trainer as my only two friends in Australia now, loser, like my service providers are my friends. Okay. And <laughs> I saw my personal trainer in the food court at the, at the mall. And I was crying and he was like, are you okay? And my personal trainer was just a normal personal trainer. I wasn't interested in him. He was okay, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Um, Roy broke up with me, but I'm okay. Can we have another session? Can we do three sessions a week now? And he's like, totally. And <laughs> hilarious my personal trainer ended up becoming really beautiful and amazing looking to me somehow uh when Roy broke up with me and he was like into meditation and healing and and all this stuff that I was like what is meditation what is healing what is personal like, development screw that healing I'm like, like I can about? heal I just I know, need I another like, man to heal I was like I didn't know what this was you mean alcohol is not going to fix my problems like I had no idea what he was talking about and it was then and there when Roy broke up with me that I looked in the mirror Jody and I was like all right baby the common denominator and the hot mess is you. You've always been here, Erica. It's you with me. Uh, we've been here always. So we can't blame my mom. So, you know, society, I can't blame Australia or that man or that man because it keeps happening to me. So it's gotta be me. And that was a really big wake up call moment. When you look in the mirror and you go, you know what? It's me. It's not you. It's not because I'm a single mother. It's not because I'm a only child or foster kid. It's because I'm responsible for this shit. And then Hamish, my, my personal trainer said to me, look, I know a coach and you could try this and you could try this. And he was really gentle about it. And I started working on myself. I fell in love with my personal trainer. We got married and had babies and he's my husband and I love him. I he's love amazing. that. And he's so yeah. cute. He's so cute. He's such a good man. And I just started unraveling for eight years, Jody. I worked wow. on all my shit. I, I spent that. a lot of money on credit cards that I didn't have. And mm -hmm. then in 2018, I was like, I want to help women do this. Like, I want to do this. And that was really the, the catalyst for it. But I spent a lot of time with myself and my shit before trying to help other people, which I think a lot of coaches need to do. I agree with you. And I think, again, the key is like, this has been a journey for you, Erica. You didn't just wake mm. up one day and go, I'm going to be a confidence coach. I'm going to yeah. help other women. You had to drag your ass through all of this shit. Yeah. And then you had to have this, this maybe a couple of years worth of awakening of knowing like what you so simply are saying right now, 
which you can say with such confidence is, hey, the common denominator for bringing all this crap into my life, like, let's stop blaming my childhood, okay? Because if we drag Mm -hmm. this through our entire life, ain't nothing good going to happen to us because we're going to play the victim. And, you know, playing the victim doesn't get us anywhere. But being aware of that it's you, it's like, I guess the same thing as, you know, saying out loud, you're an alcoholic or you're a drug addict or whatever it is, but saying it out loud, I am the common denominator. I've got to work on myself because it's not going to happen any other way and not through osmosis or hoping or through, you know, a coach telling me I'm wonderful because we know that doesn't work. (laughs) A hundred percent. It's basically what we're saying is you have to sweat the sweat. You have to cry the tears. You have Mm -hmm. to go through. I mean, people want to be resilient without moving through hard shit. I'm like, that's impossible. Like you, you have to move through all of this stuff made me who I am. Is it horrible? Yes. And if I just go, this bad stuff happened to me, then that sucks. But if I go, this bad stuff happened to me and who I became because of it is X, Y, Z. And, and, and like being able to, you know, work with this, alchemize these difficulties so that you can actually use it for your benefit in the future. And so, you know, I I definitely burned in the fire. I definitely have walked the walk and talked the talk. I've, I've been there. And I think that that's why I'm able to attract the women I attract now is because I sat in my shit and genuinely invested the money. I took money out of savings. I put it on credit cards. I, I did the hard yards. So I know when a woman invests in herself with me, I know how that feels. I know when she's, you know, questioning and doubting herself and feeling literally like she is broken, damaged goods. I'm like, yeah, I get it. I know how that feels. Like I didn't start as the queen of confidence and I still every day, you know, try to step into her. She's my alter shego. Like my Sasha Fierce is the queen of confidence. Like today I want to be her. What do I do to step into her and what helps me be her and how can I stand as her no matter what's going on? And so I think that that's really the process is figuring out who do you want to be? Who are you done being? What are you done doing? What do you need to start doing? And how can you start stepping into that stuff? And you, you won't get it unless you go through something hard. That's your wake up call. What if somebody doesn't know, what if they are in that tough place? They are going through shit in their, in their opinion, but what if they don't know who they want to be? Yeah. What kind of tips could you give somebody who just, they're so stuck. They don't even know who they want to be then I would just go, who do you not want to be? What do you not want? Like if oh. you're if you're in the negative, it's like, well, I know I don't want to be married to you. Well, I know I don't want to work here. Well, I know I don't want to become like my mother. Okay, what's your mother like? Write it all down. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to sit at home and watch shit TV. I don't want to drink alcohol every night. I don't want to have obesity issues. I don't want to have heart issues. Cool, at least you know what you don't want because mm-hmm. sometimes you're right. It is hard to go, I want this big vision. Maybe you're so in the shit right now that there's no vision, but at least you could say what you don't want. And I think that that's how it started for me. I, I know I'm not this and I know I'm not that. I don't know who I am, Jody. Like today in 2022, 2023, Erica, I don't know who I am, but I know who I don't want to be. And every day I peel a layer off of who I don't want to be and what I don't want to do. And the more I peel off, the more I get to who I am. So I don't know who I am because next week I might think something different. And I hope I do because that means I'm evolving and growing. You're like growing. I don't want to know who I am. That sounds so limiting and, and concrete. Like I know myself. I don't know myself. I hope you don't know yourself either if you're listening to this. And I right. hope that you figure out who you're not. That's, that's really it, you know? Do you... With that said, do you feel confident every day or is that something you still feel like you need to work on on a daily basis? So I want to tell you this, uh, and I'm going to possibly do a new addition to the book because new things have happened as it does in life. And when I look up confidence as a definition, there's a, a Latin definition and it's my favorite and it's not in the book, which is ridiculous. So the Latin definition of confidence is confidere, which means to trust in yourself, trusting yourself. I looked up the definition before we started the show. Yes. So good. So good. So trusting myself. Trust. And I will say every goddamn day I trust myself. I trust myself because I've seen what I've been able to do and I've made it up till now. So does it mean I'm confident in speaking on a TED stage? No, I've never done that. I would be so shit scared. But do I trust that I would be able to work it out? Yes. So 
the self-confidence, which in Spanish, it's confianza, which means trust. Literally, it, it goes straight into the word trust. It's not about confidence, right? So do I trust myself? Every day I trust myself because I have a track record with myself and I'm still here. Do I feel confident all the time? Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> no. And I, you know, I think that's important for people to hear that even somebody yeah. like you who is, has gone through all of these struggles is helping, helping women all over the world become confidence, which you are the, why you are the queen of confidence that you still have to work on you. And I think that's important mm -hmm. because you don't want people to look at, you know, I've gone through it. You probably go through it like, oh, well, you so have your shit together. You're like, no, like, yeah. no, I don't. And yeah. that's why I can understand what you're going through. Totally. And that's the thing. I think that's a bullshit excuse that women tell themselves instead of going for it. Like, do you know what? Nobody has it together. I don't believe anyone. I don't believe the Kardashians or Oprah or JLo or Brene Brown. I believe that's a lazy thing that those of us who are not willing to do what it takes believes. And it's so lazy to go, no, but easy for you, Jody. you're fit. Easy for you, Erica, you're confident. It's like, no, actually it's not. It's fucking difficult for me to show up every day, every day. And, and practice confidence. I am, I am in the arena getting ridiculed. I am fucking up. I am falling flat on my ass publicly all the time. I'm getting yep. it wrong. I'm second guessing. I'm doubting, but I'm still doing it. I am I, I, the least thing from confident confidence is moving through the discomfort walking in the dark and having courage to mess up and get up anyway and go again that's what confidence is it's not that I've got something you don't or I'm sorted it's right. I'm being risk taker I am courageous I'm willing to burn and mess up because of the experience of burning and messing up who that's going to make me be that's right. the thing you know that's Right. And I, you know, in your book, you talk about no belief, no power. Practicing mm. confidence is hard because practi practicing presence is hard. Mm. Do you remember yeah. writing that? Yeah, 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 I do. I'm like, hey. Oh, damn, that's good. No. <laughs> that was really good. Really um, <laughs> and yeah, right. Go, please, everybody, before you write your, your, your second book, um, Get confidence feels like shit, and and I I remember when I I bought it and the title caught my eye and Very you look so powerful on the cover caught my eye and I wanted to know more about you and I'm like I remember thinking why does this why did this woman name the book confidence feels like shit because <laughs> confidence should feel good but then after reading your story and getting to know you I understand that the shit part is the whole struggle which is why it feels shitty as you're trying to become confident. Am I right in that understanding? Yes. Yeah. So okay. like the full thing is like the uh, confidence feels like shit, the truth about confidence and what it really takes to create it. So it's like, mm. this is the truth that, that I don't know about you, but I feel like I got sold and we all get sold the gold star. Listen, when you're confident, then you'll do the thing. When you, if you were just more confident, right. then you would get a pay rise. Only if you were more confident, then it's like, oh, all I need is to do, be more confident. No one tells right. you what's required in order to be more confident. Like, yeah, you right. can have more confidence if you're willing to move through the emotions like shame, feeling stupid, messing up, being ridiculed, your family ostracizing you, you know, going alone, walking in the dark, possibly slipping, cutting yourself, falling over, you know, like yeah, people hating on you, all of that yeah, you can be confident. Then everyone's like, oh, I don't want to do that. That sounds terrible. Then I'm like, how dare you like judge another woman and be like, she's confident and I'm not. And I'm like, I wanted to expose the truth because I feel like if I do a TED talk or you do a TED talk and we kill it because we will, because we have belief in ourselves that we will kill it. So we're going to try really hard. We're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to be shit scared. And then we're going to speak into that mic and we're going to kill it. That's what's going to happen for us. Right. Everyone's going to watch our TED Talk and go, oh, Jody and Erica killed that TED Talk. Man, they're so confident. I wish I was confident like Jody and Erica. And I'm going to go, baby, listen, <laughs> you missed you missed the part where I was submitting my application and I didn't submit my application for two years because I was so scared. You missed right. the part where right before I got on stage, I took yes. three spiritual poos and my legs were shaking and my underarms were so sweaty that I had to change my outfit. You missed the part where I was second guessing myself every five seconds as I took a step to the red rug. You missed all of that. Mm. And all you saw was Erica killing it. Bitch, please. 
I wish you could see how fucked up the whole process for me to get my ass on that stage was. Will I kill it? Hell yeah. But the experience of it is horrible. And no one gets to understand that unless we talk about, hey, baby, if you're doubting yourself right now, hey, if you're listening to this and you don't know who you are and you're questioning your worthiness, high five. You are on track yes. to creating confidence. That's what it feels like. It feels like fucking shit. <laughs> yes. I love, I love what you just said. That was per, so perfectly said. And yeah. it's what you said at the beginning of the show, the awareness, being present, but really living through those really, 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 really scary times. Mm. And nobody, nobody gets that. So going back to what led you to be a coach and yeah. helping women, empowering women, inspiring women, you were also got into fashion styling and you realized that once you were in styling a woman and she, in your opinion, physically on the outside looked perfect, quote unquote, perfect. What was really going through your, their head that you realized after doing this? Yeah. So in, in Florida, when I said I went to hair school, so I was a hairdresser, I was doing hair and I loved doing women's hair and makeup. It was always something I loved as a kid. So I was like, cool. When I moved to Australia, someone asked me, are you a stylist? And I was like, I'm not a stylist, but I could totally do that business. So then I started studying fashion styling. So I went from hair and makeup to now external, more external confidence clothing. So I would dress women for their body shape and help them look good. I would do these beautiful workshops. And these women looked amazing from the you know bird's eye view from the outside. Yes immaculate outfit, nails, hair, makeup, all that. And they look in the mirror and be like, I just don't feel good enough. I just still hate myself. And then I was just like twitching, like what? I spent my whole life doing hair and makeup and clothing and dressing you. And you look perfect for your body shape and your colors. And you still look in the mirror and you hate yourself. Then I knew right then and there, Jody, because I was going through my own experience. I was working right. with a coach, but my, myself. So eight years of my own healing while I was styling women. And I'm like, Ooh, this is an inner wardrobe. Like we need to be culling the thoughts. The inner wardrobe needs to be cleaned up. It's we're cleaning up their real wardrobe, throwing away their, you know, breastfeeding t-shirt and right. their maternity underwear. And I'm like, we need to be throwing away the thought that says I'm too fat. I'm not pretty enough. I'm too old. I'm not good enough. I'm this. So I decided to flip it. And in 2018, I was like, I'm not going to be a stylist anymore. I am going to now do the internal wardrobe cleaning the internal work of confidence because it was all up till then it was all external it was like image right. and hair and so that was the moment for me where I realized because I was going through my own experience where I was like nah we need to talk about the thoughts and the feelings and we need to cry and we need to unravel all the bullshit beliefs and it really got me excited and that's how everything kind of started so when you have a woman I'm sure they range in all ages yeah. that are dealing with their confidence. They may not realize it's their confidence, but they reach out to you. Have you ever had anybody come to you and you realize they're not ready for that next step? Or can you always bring them to that next step? Yeah, I, I think I can't bring anyone anywhere. But I, what I do see is people might join my program and they get excited about the possibility and then they get scared. Um, yeah. And I do believe this is the thing that stops people from joining our program because we've talked to a lot of people and they're scared that they're going to reopen up their old past shit and they're not going to be able to handle Pandora's box. And I'm like, if that's you right now, if you've stopped yourself from getting a therapist, yeah. if you've stopped yourself from joining a coaching program or getting support for yourself, because everybody needs it, doesn't matter who you are and what you've been through. If you've stopped yourself because you're scared that you're going to open up old stuff and you're not going to be able to handle it, I want to say to you, you already went through it. You already handled it. If you're breathing right. and you're alive and you move through all that difficult stuff you move through, like we all overcame a pandemic, like we've moved through some hard stuff. Mm. I'm like, get a reward for it get the lessons in the shit, like shit sucks, but there are golden jewels and diamonds in the pile of shit at your front door. And you're like, I don't want to put my hand in it. And I'm like, you already went through it. So you might as well get the reward. So when I see women that don't want to do the work on themselves, Jody, that's what it is. They're scared. They're not going to be, be able to handle all of that. And I'm like, you already handled it. Now you're just going to get the lessons from it so that you don't repeat that same shit, literally. And you can now take the lesson and move into your life, creating what you want from learning from those difficult experiences you already moved through. It is very scary. 
it is, you know, I've gone through that and it is scary. Um, you know, just as like people coming to my studio, they're scared. They're like, what is Jody going to do to me? You know, and they, what they don't realize is that I'm really not training them. I am training them physically, but it's the mental part. Yeah. And so it's sort of like, you, I come through the back door yeah, um, yeah. because they don't realize that they're actually using me as a therapist, even though I'm not a trained therapist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so much of the physical, like when you started going to the gym again, so much of the physical, because you always worked out, you knew that physical part was always also going to help you mentally. Totally. So take me through, I, I need to mention something to you. So I don't know if you're familiar with this comedian named Eliza Schlesinger. Do you know who she is? No. Okay. Check her out on YouTube. She's um probably she's probably like your age. And she's like in, you know, uh she had a show before she had her baby. It was called Elder Millennial. So I think she's like 38, 39. She's had a baby. So I've that. watched her get married, have a baby. Aww. Now she's so, but one of her scenes, if you ever can pull up her show, Elder Millennial, she talks about how. Um, girls move from guy to guy, right? Going yeah. back to what you said a few minutes ago about your stuff, like just thinking a man's going to change it. And, you know, mm. you meet this cute guy and, you know, everything's all great. And he's like, you know, why don't you move in? And she does this thing where she goes, and you walk into his apartment and you go, boom, there's all my shit. Now deal with it. It was something like yeah. that. And it's yeah. like, you can so relate to it because you haven't even opened up that box of shit for that guy who thinks that there's love and there's a relationship there. You're like, yeah, look in the bag. That's really yeah. who I am. It's not <laughs> this, 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 the hair, the lashes, the nails, everything you were talking about the outside yeah. of us. It's the internal crap that we're scared to show anybody. Totally. Yeah. So yeah. it, if somebody, um, how does somebody get in touch with you and tell me a little bit about your program if you can? Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. I use that same analogy and, and I say like, you sweep your shit under the rug. It's like, no, 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 I'm not going to deal with that right now. And you just sweep it under the rug, sweep it under the rug. And then one day you're like about to go to work and the rug is like this mountain and you're <laughs> trying to holy oh, shit. And then you get a skeleton, grab your leg and you're like, get off me. I have to go to work. I can't deal with this right now. And you like shake this skeleton off to like go to work put a mask on and pretend everything's great. And at home, you have this fucking mountain in your living room. It's like, yeah. you have to look at it or it's going to consume you, you know? Um, so yeah, I have a program. I work in groups. So a lot of people ask me, how come you don't do one-on-one? -on -one? And I, I really believe like I was in community and in community is where everything for me changed. And I'm positive. It's because I was a foster kid. I love communities. I love women connecting. There's nothing new about women's group coaching programs. This is how our ancestors connected y'all. Okay. Women would sit in circles and we would share women's mystery wisdom business. Like that's what we would do. And Beautiful. so now, right. right. Like now we have fences and, 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 you know, we're across from our neighbors and we don't have the village anymore. However, women know how to do this. We get into community and we're not gossiping backstabbing catty people. That's not true. Like, I don't believe that about women. I think some women could be like that, but the women I see, they want connection. They're open and they share and they're vulnerable. And so yes. I work in a, in a, in a connection. Like I work in a group container where, you know, instead of you thinking you're the only one with your story, you hear from another woman and another woman and people see you and hear you and validate you and hold space for you to unravel. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the, the best thing ever. So that's the sisterhood. And that's, um, I want to say it's 12 months. It's 12 months minimum, but we have women that have been in there for four years in this mm -hmm. community, um, doing the work, unraveling, working on themselves. And we really touch on the six key areas. The area number one is managing your mind. And it's mm -hmm. about understanding what you're thinking and that your thoughts create your feelings and your feelings make you take action or no action. And right. that is what gives you your results. And when you understand your thoughts and your feelings, you can change every single part of your life. So it's the first area that I recommend anyone ever works on is what am I thinking? How am I feeling? What actions am I taking? And what result is that getting me right now? And if you want to change the result, you have to go to the thinking, you have to go to the feeling, you have to go to the action. So we work on managing our mind and thinking and feeling. And then we work on FWOT and that stands for fuck what others think or forget what others think. 
in case you want to teach your kids the shame, the judgment, right? The shame and the judgment. Totally. It's letting go of the good opinion of others. Sometimes it's the good opinion, your family, your parents, people that love you, letting go of the need of caring so much what people think. And I know we will always care because it's part of our, you know, you know, like it's our biology. I get it. I understand that we care, but not letting it stop you. You can care what people think without letting it stop you doing what you want. So FWOT is a whole section. It's, it's the best section. It's like own who you are, go out there and be you fully expressed. Um, the third one is ego and alter shigo. So we have a process in there where we talk about how to create your, your altered self. How do you, how do you step into the Jody that you know yourself to be like, what does she need? What kind of music does she listen to? Is there something that she needs to be activated in? Like, kind of like Sasha Fierce, kind of like Wonder Woman. There's certain things that you do that make you be the queen of confidence that make you be Jody. Like, your alter shigo. And then we talk about that. self-love and worthiness. Yeah, it's so fun. Self-love and worthiness, that could be 10 years of its own work. That's yeah. a very big um, module lesson that we work on. It's self-love. There's a lot about body image in there. There's a lot about, you know, loving yourself and genuinely caring for yourself. Um, not about having a bath or getting a massage. Like that's not what we mean when we say love yourself and right. self-care. Like I'm so boundary. glad you clarified that. Yeah. Like, I'm so tired of like, get a manicure, like go have rosé. That's not self-love, like, please, no, you know, um, consumerism. And then the next one is um, we talk about relationships. And in that module, my husband does the module with me. And he basically looks at it from the perspective of a man. So we have women from all different kind of gender biases in the, in the group. So someone who might be identify as lesbian, someone who might identify as, you know, polyamorous, but he comes in with the masculine. So he comes in with, as a man, the way that I see relationship. And it helps a lot of our clients who are in these relationships with men Mm -hmm. because we don't understand how they think. We don't understand why they don't do X, Y, Z. So he comes into that module and we talk about boundaries, communication, building really great relationships. And it's, yeah, it's a really big one. That one's one of the biggest modules we have in there. And then the next one is, the last one is about money and manifesting. And I think it's important, even though it's a life coaching business, uh, life coaching program that we speak about women making money and women creating wealth and how we manifest, how do we attract? So it's not like spiritual manifesting, which I love that. It's like, no, 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 you're attracting and you're manifesting. How are you doing that? And how can we fix that? And so that's the module. So really it's kind of like changing your life. That's why I think people stay for four years, but it's such an amazing community of women. We have live coaching. Uh, I do coach the ladies in there, but more so it's, it's us doing life together instead of feeling like I'm alone, alone with this. Yeah. We do it together. And you know what I love? We have like two minutes left, but what I love about everything that you've said throughout this entire conversation is look, there's a place for a woohoo. And you know what I mean? Like, woohoo. Totally. But what you're doing and you the way you talk, it's, okay, girls, go do the woohoo. But when you come to me, we're getting straight down to business, girlfriends, because yeah. yeah. we want to change our life. We don't want you being there anymore. And, and so if somebody wants to um, get involved in your yeah. community, how do they do that? Yes. So um, I'm going to give you, Jody a beautiful uh, cheat sheet that you guys can download. Everybody who's listening or watching the five steps to creating confidence that Thank will you. hook you up right now, no matter where you are in your journey, you'll be able to, uh, you don't have to print it. You could even type into it and it will tell you like, what is the next step for you? If you're wanting to create confidence in yourself. So that's probably oh, the best thing. You. I love free resources. I think yes. it's way easier than to join a program, right? It's like do that. And then if that resonates with you, come over to Instagram tag us, tag me and Jody in your stories. If you like this episode, come say hi, we are on there. We love being on there. Um, uh, so I think that that would be the best on Instagram, the queen of confidence, the website, queen of confidence podcast, confidence chronicles, and this little free checklist that will help you to create confidence now, like not in five thank years, you. like today. Thank so thank you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. I have one last question for you. And then we're going to end the show. And I knew this time would go by so fast, <laughs> but what does it mean to you to be fearlessly authentic. Oh, I love that. I feel like it's my, it's step two in the practice of confidence for me, the cheat sheet. It's like courage, courage, which is I'm scared as hell, but I am going to show up anyway because I am worthy and who I am is, is accepted here. And I get to be me. And to me, fearlessly authentic is just like to myself. Can I allow myself to say what I want to say, be who I want to be? and let go of 
what other people think about me. Gorgeous. You're the best. Thank you. I love you. Erica Kramer, the queen of confidence, her book, Confidence Feels Like Shit, the truth about confidence and what it really takes to create it. And let's look out for her other book and all the information will be in the podcast and in the show remarks and how to get in touch with you. Thank you so much from Australia. Thank you for finally being here on Fearlessly Authentic. And to everybody listening, until next week, go and live your most fearlessly authentic life ever. Bye. Bye.